Okay, welcome to everyone who is tuning in to tonight's EBFA webinar. Happy holidays as well. As always, it is a pleasure to have everyone join us. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in to an EBFA webinar, then welcome. I hope that you enjoy your experience. And if you are a longtime EV EBFA follower and fan and certified professional, then of course, Thank you as well, and great to see you virtually. Uh, I am very excited to go through this topic. It's a topic that is uh, always a hot topic, which is so funny. Um, even if I would speak about it all the time, people love to talk about Bunyan. So here we go. We are going into the final webinar of 2020, where we are looking at some myths, misconceptions, and how bunions affect our movement, and then answering some of your questions and perhaps some of your top misconceptions that involve bunions. If this is uh, your first time with EBFA or you may not be familiar with who I am, uh, my name is Dr. Splickle. I am the founder of EBFA Global. I'm also a functional podiatrist uh, trained as a foot surgeon, so I've done hundreds of bunion surgeries myself. Uh, human movement specialist. I am the author of a lot of EBFA's education and also the founder of Naboso. This is being recorded. So if for some reason you get disconnected or you want to re-listen or you want to share it after you hear it, then everyone will get the recording after this is completed. And you will also get the PowerPoint. So if you want to have the PDF of this PowerPoint, you will get that as well. Um, and after we go through the lecture, I'm gonna open up the floor so you can answer any, ask any questions that you might have about bunions, some of your clients, patients, et cetera. Let's get started. So some of the key topics that we're going to go over is some of the anatomy and biomechanics around bunions and bunion formation. What is a bunion? That is the million dollar question. What causes bunions? There's a lot of misconceptions around that. The impact of bunions, that'll be particularly around movement, this bunion severity scale, and then really what is appropriate depending on the severity of the bunion. Is corrective exercise or is surgery more appropriate? And then there's a lot of misconceptions around surgery that um, don't ever do it, the bunion will come back, high failure rate, complication, complication, a lot of stuff that is truly misconceptions. And then finally wrapping it up with what is not a bunion. So here we go. Let's get started. First misconception that's gonna bring us in right away to this is that bunions are a growth on the side of the foot. So it's an overgrowth on the side of the foot. And that's, that's a big misconception. So let's go into what is a bunion. So here we go. This is a bunion. Let's look first, like almost if I, my hand is covering the left side of the screen, but if I could cover that up and you're looking at a foot on the right. So this is going to be the clinical look at a foot. We see this large bump on the inside of this left foot. A large growth is what a lot of patients or clients probably think of it. Yes, of course, the toe is angled over, the toe is rotated, we got a contracture in the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. We have some calluses, but a lot of people are focusing on this growth of the inside of the left foot. Let's take a look at the x-ray. We look over to the left. What we see is that it's really not a growth. It is the bone itself. It is the first metatarsal head that is pushing out of the foot. And that's what this bump or this growth is. So misconception that it's a growth on the foot. It is your actual bone. It is your first metatarsal head that is deviated. The long first metatarsal deviates out. And then the head, which was originally aligned with the base of the proximal phalanx of the first digit, angles out and that's what that prominence is, is it's the head of the first metatarsal. So that's what it is. And we're gonna take a deep dive at this even more, but we wanna first debunk that first myth. Now, one thing that I also hear around it is that when people start to get maybe flat feet or the earliest signs of a bunion, then the body starts to lay bone down to maintain your balance when you're standing. And that is a myth as well. 
that still goes back to the fact that it is the first metatarsal that's swinging out. Could you get some increased bone growth because the bone is hitting the pavement and then you start to get a little bit of a spurring? Sure, but still a lot of the eminence. So this is called a medial eminence. A lot of the actual medial eminence is just the met head itself. You don't have a large proportion of the bump being excess bone growth. So we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to that. So let's take a look. We're going to look at the right foot here, right foot on x-ray. When we look at this, I'm just going to go over some kind of laying of the land on the x-ray is the long bones here are called your metatarsals. Okay. This is going to be your midfoot. For those that have taken any courses through EBFA or you're familiar with foot anatomy, we'll just quickly familiarize ourselves. If you can see my arrow, this is going to be your navicular. Over here is going to be your cuboid. These are your cuneiforms and then your metatarsals. So we have along here, this relationship where my arrow is, right here is off of the screen, but this is your talus. So your talus and your navicular, that's your midfoot. And then we come forward, you have your navicular into your cuneiform, that's a joint. And then your cuneiform into your first metatarsal, that is a very important joint. That met cuneiform joint is also referred to as your first ray. Your first ray has its own axis. So similar to your hand, how your thumb, if you move your, your thumb, your metacarpal with your thumb, it has its own axis. It kind of moves up and down, similar to how the first ray on your foot does. If you were just now joining me and you grab your first metatarsal on your foot, you can actually move it up and down similar to your thumb. And the way that you're able to do that from an evolution perspective is that if you think evolutionarily from a primate and then we kind of deviated into this homo sapien plantigrade foot is that it's the opposable thumb on the foot of a primate that comes in and becomes the first ray. So that's what's stabilizing. And that's how the thumb of a primate becomes the first ray on a homo sapien. And then that's how you compare, can compare the hand having its own axis on the thumb being similar to the first ray in our foot. Okay. But just appreciate the foot first ray has its own axis and it goes up and down. Now, the first ray influences the stability of your first ray influences everything around your first MPJ, including bunion formation. It influences range of motion, but it also influences bunion formation. Now where bunions occur are going to be back here at the met cuneiform joint and any instability is going to allow that first metatarsal to swing out and when it swings out, it actually mimics the way that a primate's foot was shaped. Okay, let's look at the x-ray again here real quick. So this is, of course, going to be our first MPJ, first metatarsal phalangeal joint here. And what I want you to appreciate is that anytime you're looking at a first MPJ on x-ray, you're looking for joint space, joint alignment and joint space. So I am looking at the cartilaginous surface so right here where my arrow is, that's one cartilaginous surface. And then my arrow here on the base of the proximal phalanx is another cartilaginous surface and they are in alignment. Great, healthy joint. The joint space, I see good joint space in here, right? Joint space, joint space. So that means that there is cushion and that the cartilage is present in a healthy way. So there's fluid, there's space, there's cushion, there's joint alignment, healthy, healthy joint, great, okay? And then finally, we're looking at these two sesamoid bones, which are sitting directly underneath the first metatarsal head. Their alignment is going to be reflective of the small muscle, intrinsic muscle alignment. That's what we're looking at here. Let's take a jump over to the foot on the left. So we look over here. So now what we're looking for, and this is really a mild to moderate bunion, 
let's say, but here, this is you looking at an x-ray of a bunion, a foot with a bunion. Do you see the prominence? This is the medial eminence. Again, it's the metatarsal head. It's not a growth of bone. Let's look here at the metatarsal cuneiform joint. And what we actually see here is this angle that's being measured is the intermetatarsal angle. The more that that opens up, the larger the bunion. So that's the way that bunions are measured. They're not measured by the size of the bump. That would be subjective. It's actually measured based off of the intermetatarsal angle. Now, as that angle opens up more and more, the prominence of the metatarsal head becomes more and more exposed, hence the larger the bunion or the bump. Okay. Now, the other thing that we can notice if we look here is the joint alignment. So here, this is one joint surface. This is another joint surface. So we can see that we have lost alignment of the joint surface. One surface is here and one surface is here. So we've deviated off of the joint, off of the cartilage. This is going to start increasing the risk of arthritis. This is going to start narrowing the joint and creating spurs and sharpness in the edges of this joint. And that's what we can actually see. There's a sharpness here. There's a little bit sharpness here, a little bit of regularity. Okay, sharp corner here, right? And that's what we would start to assess on the bunion x-ray. Final thing that I want you to look at is going to be the sesamoids. Do you see how the sesamoids are no longer directly under the first metatarsal head? They have now deviated laterally, which means that the intrinsic muscles that surround those sesamoids have also shifted. This is going to play a very important role when it comes to corrective exercise, short foot, foot stabilization in someone who has a bunion as a lot of it is influenced by sesamoid position. Okay, let's just do a real quick recap. Okay, here we go. So we're looking, what we're looking at is intermetatarsal angle, the space between the first and the second. You're also looking at the met cuneiform joint for any sort of instability there, which would be measured as a obliquity, an obliquity at the met cuneiform joint. We're looking at the joint surface and the articulation of cartilage over cartilage. Is there joint space narrowing? Is there sharpening of the corners? Is there spurring happening, which is in indicating arthritic changes in the joint? We're then finally looking at the sesamoid position to see if there's a lateral deviation of the sesamoids. Great. Okay. We went over this, but I want you to see it. Okay, so you can have this again if you want the PowerPoint or you reference back on this. This will give you a reminder of what we're looking at. So the hallux angle, real quick here, is that's just looking here. How much did the hallux or the great toe deviate? So you can measure that as well. Okay, I try not to use that as the primary indicator of the severity of the bunion because it, again, is really not what the bunion is. The bunion is related to the intermetatarsal angles, okay? Now, some of the local symptoms, what is happening in your foot when you have a bunion? So obviously you're getting a widening of the foot, your metatarsals, your intermetatarsal spaces become wider, obviously between the first and the second, that's going to widen the foot overall, which is going to make it more difficult to fit into shoes. And then when you are in shoes, it's gonna force your foot compressed, which can lead to other symptoms such as a bursitis. So there is a fluid filled sac that sits right here, right where the arrow is. This is actually pointing at a bursa. So you can see kind of the shadow that is an inflamed bursa that's being captured by x-ray. So this person would also be experiencing a bursitis. But the bursa here, the fluid-filled sac with pressure and irritation can get inflamed, hence the bursitis. You can get a secondary neuroma. So now why you can get a neuroma when you have a bunion or there's a common uh, uh, or a frequency occurrence between both is that when the foot is wider and you're wearing 
tight shoes and compressive shoes, the chances of putting pressure on a scarred nerve bundle that sits in between your metatarsals goes higher. So sometimes I've actually had patients that have had really bad neuroma. It's called a Morton's neuroma if you want. And they've done all the treatments, not responding, still has symptoms. And it really was the bunion that was driving this recurrence of symptoms in the neuroma. That was someone where you had to essentially sit down and say, really to appropriately treat your neuroma, we might need to do bunion surgery because your foot is really wide or you just have to wear wide enough shoes, but depending on the severity of the bunion, the shoes might not be wide enough. Okay. Now you of course could get uh, first MPJ pain, it makes sense, arthritis, DJD. And then the further that that hallux or the first MPJ pushes into the second, you start to get these issues with the second digit that everything starts to kind of fan over out to the lateral side of the foot. You can start to get a tear or a stress in a ligament underneath the second MPJ, which is called a plantar plate. And that is essentially the kind of the sequelae of issues of bunions. I'm sure there's more than just this as well, calluses and things like that. Ingrown toenails, you could absolutely get that with bunions, okay? Now this is really kind of the latter stage, end stage of having a bunion. Again, this is from a local perspective that we're looking at this, but we can see a large deviation between the first and the second metatarsals. This is a very large prominence. Again, it's just that first metatarsal head still. Here we look at the first MPJ. This is pretty much mm, subluxed all the way over to the lateral side, they were definitely, they're starting to be bone on bone here. So do you see that difference right here? This is bone on bone. There's a little bit of joint space here, but really where it's articulating, this is going to be quite painful and arthritic. Sesamoids are deviated laterally. So we know that's going to affect the intrinsics. And then we can see here how it's pushing into the second. So when it starts pushing and pushing into the second, eventually the second has no choice but to lift. And then here it has dislocated. So they have a dislocated second digit and then is crossed over the first. That's really the only way that your second can cross over the first is that you have to actually dislocate it. Now, the only way that you can dislocate your second digit is if you tear your plantar plate, which is again, that ligament on the bottom of the second digit. Um, and I have some videos on YouTube around plantar plates. So please do check that out if you wanna learn more about the plantar plate and what that is. But your plantar plate is part of your plantar fascia. It's an extension of your plantar fascia into your digits and it's what stabilizes the MPJs. When that tears, your toe is going to float up. So totally know that that's happening here when you have crossover deformity and then it's going to start affecting the lesser digits as well. Okay, now globally, what is happening when you have bunions? This means overall movement patterns. So if you have pain in your first MPJ when you walk, pain, or a lack of range of motion because of arthritis, you cannot get over your first MPJ or you're going to guard against going over your first MPJ. This means that every time you walk and you take a step, you are going to alter your stride length. The longer your steps, the greater the first MPJ dorsiflexion is required to take that long stride. So you will most likely shorten your strides so that you don't have to dorsiflex your first MPJ that much. Now, what happens when you shorten your stride is you start to get less hip extension. When you take away hip extension, then you start to inhibit your glutes because you become very hip flexor dominant. Your glutes obviously are not required for hip extension. So we get this inhibition of the glutes and a over dominance of your anterior hip muscles. When your glutes start to get delayed, weakened or inhibited, then you start to get SI joint pain, low back pain, knee pain, ankle sprains, plantar fasciitis, you could see a, a huge sequelae of just underactive or inhibited glutes in what that does. And that is 
oftentimes caused by first MPJ issues. Here we are saying that the bunion is the cause of the first MPJ issues. So the global impact of bunions is very high. It's not just a local problem. It's not just a cosmetic problem. It is a movement problem, a stabilization problem from that global perspective. So understanding them is very important as movement specialists. So to understand them, to understand what causes them, and then to understand how to correct them is going to be the next part of this webinar. Time for another misconception. So a lot of people think that bunions are caused by shoes, by high heels, by pointed toes shoes, by genetics, which they're really not caused by. Can you get a little bit of an angulation of your hallux or your great toe by angled shoes? Sure, but remember that bunions are much more of a metatarsal issue. Bunions are not just this angulation of the hallux relative to the foot. It is more of a first MPJ issue. So here we go. What's really causing our bunions is going to be something that causes an instability of your first ray because the center of deformity or the center of access of the deformity in a bunion is the met cuneiform joint. So whatever causes instability of the first metatarsal joint, first met cuneiform joint is going to be any sort of rear foot instability. Rear foot pronation causes midfoot and first ray instability. So we wanna look at what is causing a rear foot pronation. Is it a weak posture tibialis? Maybe. Is it weak glutes? Maybe. Is it weak core? Maybe. Is it ligament laxity? Maybe, right? So all of those things we need to understand as the trainer and the coach. Forgot one. Is it limited ankle dorsiflexion? So therefore they're compensating through rear foot pronation. That's a huge one, right? But really the underlying cause that we want to look at is rear foot pronation unlocks the foot and creates this instability in the first ray. Okay. Now, a big one that we want to understand and appreciate is ligament laxity. So this is where genetics could come into play a little bit. So when you say that bunions are genetic, my mom had bunions or my grandmother had bunions, whatever it is, what is genetic is our propensity to get them, meaning the risk factors of ligament laxity. So our collagen, the integrity of our connective tissue, that has a genetic propensity towards it, more so than the actual bunion itself. Um, so when you have a hypermobile foot, because of ligament laxity, again, that's the part that is genetic. When you have a child, a teenager with bunions, this is referred to as juvenile hallux valgus. And this is always, 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 always associated with ligament laxity. A hypermobile first ray is always associated with a juvenile hallux valgus. Okay, so if you see bunions in a client who is young, maybe you're not seeing them as a teenager, but they're early 20s and they have a large bunion, just ask them, say, how long have you had this bunion? If they say, I've always had it, right? They probably had it since they were a teenager and that it is a juvenile hallux valgus, okay? Now, there are some muscle imbalances that are associated with bunions intrinsic muscle imbalances. And these muscle imbalances that I go over are going to be centered around the distal aspect of the foot or around that first MPJ. So they are going to be centered here, okay? The muscle imbalances around the first ray, it's a little bit different because those muscle imbalances don't really cause a bunion. Um, and for those who are familiar with the tibialis anterior and the pronius longus how, and how they insert on the first ray, they're really not directly the cause of bunions or the prevention of bunions. You're really looking back at the rear foot. Um, yes, we need to stabilize the midfoot and that can be done with orthotics, 
but from a corrective exercise, I would not spend your time trying to strengthen the peroneus longus to prevent bunions because there's just really no research around that. I would spend your time strengthening the posterior tibialis and the core and the glutes to prevent bunions versus the peroneus longus. Okay. And then of course, creating balance around the intrinsic muscles that we're going over right now. So this is your first MPJ from an intrinsic perspective and the way that all of these muscles balance that joint. So let's take a look here first. This one right here where my arrow is, this is going to be your abductor hallucis. You can see along here, it's inserting on the inside of the heel bone, crossing underneath right here is your navicular bone. And then it crosses or it continues this way, inserts on the side of your uh, hallux or your proximal phalanx, and then it shares a tendon with another muscle right here. Do you see these two bellies? This muscle with the two bellies in it is called your flexor hallucis brevis. So your flexor hallucis brevis is here, and the medial belly of the flexor hallucis brevis shares a tendon with your abductor hallucis. So it shares a tendon. Over here, we have the lateral belly to the flexor hallucis brevis, and that is joined by this kind of seven-shaped muscle, which is your adductor hallucis. Your adductor hallucis is going to be in uh, synergy with the lateral belly of your flexor hallucis brevis. That's on one side. And then on the other side is the medial belly of the flexor hallucis brevis with your abductor hallucis brevis, uh, abductor hallucis, my apologies. So then here, this is where your tug of war happens around your bunion. Adductors on one side, abductors on the other side. If we take a look at the picture here and just visualize you have three muscles on one side, two muscles on the other side, who is gonna win this tug of war? It's gonna be the adductors, which are pulling the toe into the bunion. So there's a strong, mechanical advantage in favor of your adductors, a strong advantage in favor of the adductors, which is why when you start getting a bunion, bunion formation just kind of can progress quite easily because of the favor of these intrinsic muscles. This is also why when I go over the surgery in a moment, part of bunion surgery is to actually cut and release the adductor hallucis. That is part of the bunion surgery because it is such a strong deforming force. The adductor hallucis is such a strong deforming force in bunion formation, which is also why when you get a bunion of a certain severity and you try to use bunion correctors and bunion stretchers and bunion booties that I show you and correct toes and short foot, all of that stuff does not work because the adductor hallucis is just such a strong muscle. It is so strong that we have to cut it during surgery, okay? That's just to give you perspective of how strong this is and why doing certain stretchers and bunion splints and things like that just don't work, okay? All right, so here we go. Let's look at our sesamoids again. So we had emphasized here, do you see that, remember this is the ideal alignment for the bun or for the sesamoids, that it is directly under the first metatarsal head. When you have a bunion, we can see this lateral deviation. Now, if we take a look at what that looks like underneath here, do you see how it deviates? So this is the alignment. You can see there's a ridge. So there's actually a groove. So your sesamoids sit within a groove within the first metatarsal head. Your sesamoids do and your sesamoids sit within the tendon of your flexor hallucis brevis. Let me just say that again. Your sesamoids, the two small bones underneath your first metatarsal head that are supposed to be situated under your first metatarsal head lie within the tendon of your flexor hallucis brevis. They sit right here, okay? They sit within the tendon. That's where they're supposed to sit. They sit there so that they can help create balance with your abductor hallucis and your adductor hallucis. 
Now, when you get a bunion, your sesamoid shift laterally. That means that your intrinsic muscles shift laterally. Your abductor hallucis, your flexor hallucis brevis, they shifted laterally, okay? You can also see here that because they shift laterally or when they shift laterally, they are no longer in that groove. When they are not in that groove, they kind of shift and they're technically off of cartilage because there's cartilage in that groove. So you can actually get a sesamoid first met head arthritis. So sitting underneath the sesamoids, you can get arthritis. And that is part of where people think it is a sesamoiditis, but it's really not a classic sesamoiditis. It's not a sesamoid fracture. It is this sesamoid met head arthritis. And then those sesamoids can actually get stuck, that the arthritis gets really bad, that they just get adhered down. And the purpose of your sesamoids is that they transfer power force through your first MPJ, similar like the patella of your knee, that it's for a physics reasons, you get more leverage out of your quads because of your patella. Same thing here, you get more power out of the first MPJ with your sesamoids. When you have arthritis and they're adhered down, you lose some of that power. So just think of that also as a potential future impact of having bunions, okay? Now, sesamoid position is an indicator of your intrinsic muscle alignment. I already said that. If your sesamoid shift laterally, your intrinsic muscle shift laterally. That means that your abductor hallucis, your flexor hallucis brevis, muscles that you engage when you do short foot shifted over. It makes it very difficult to engage short foot and to do intrinsic muscle exercises when you have a bunion and when your bunion is situated in the bunion position, meaning you have not pulled the toe over with correct toes or something like that, okay? So if you've ever wondered why it is so difficult for someone with a bunion to do short foot exercise, the reason is that their sesamoids have shifted laterally. When their sesamoid shifted, it took the abductor hallucis muscle with it. So you have changed the position of a muscle you're trying to engage. I hope that makes sense. All right. So can exercise correct a bunion? Million dollar question, right? This is the other million dollar question. Can exercise correct a bunion? So here's our next, next misconception. Bunions can be corrected and reversed with exercise. This is where you could go online or people tell me all the time, oh no, Dr. Emily, I corrected my bunion with exercise. I would say, I want to see your x-rays before and your x-rays after. Because if you have moved your first, your hallux over and it looks in better alignment, but you did not change your intermetatarsal angle, did you correct the bunion with exercise? No. You moved the toe over, which is a cosmetic change that you did. Did you actually change, again, what the bunion is? Remember, the bunion is the angulation at the met cuneiform joint and that intermetatarsal angle. So we just want to make sure we're speaking the same language here, okay? Now, can they be corrected? Maybe. It depends right? What I often say is that depending on the severity of the bunion, you could push pause on where that bunion is. Can you reverse a bunion? No. You cannot make that intermetatarsal angle decrease or the first metatarsal come in without surgery. So what we want to actually say is, can I get better alignment of my helix relative to my first met head? Sure, we could talk about that. Can I uh, pause the progression of my bunion? Sure. Can I stabilize my foot and improve foot to core sequencing despite have a bunion? Sure, okay. So here, let's take a look at some of the bunion severity that we have. We have mild, mild again. So I'm. this is just showing you pictures of them versus the actual intermetatarsal angle because the chances of you seeing an x-ray and actually measuring the angle is probably lower. So we'll do it off of 
uh, kind of this subjective look at it. But really any bunion that is mild like this, anything beyond moderate onward, completely different discussion. This is where your, your role as a coach, movement specialist, trainer comes in is right here. Can you push pause on that bunion? Yes, I do believe that if you do corrective exercise, you use correctors, you use bunion booty, you do short foot, you can get that hallux more in alignment with the first metatarsal, right? So it cosmetically looks better. And then that intermetatarsal angle will stay the same. But when you bring the toe out a little bit, this bump will actually look smaller. Will you actually uh, narrow out the foot? No, but can you pause it? Sure. Okay. Now here, any of these other ones, the deviation off of the first MPJ and all these three other situations is going to be too high that they're probably at a increased risk of arthritis. And you may actually want to suggest surgery or get a referral for someone who may suggest surgery in this situation. Um, and I will go over when I suggest surgery. When is that sweet spot of suggesting bunion surgery? So let's go into some of the corrective exercise that you can do and some of the splinting techniques for, let me just go real back, real quick back, this one. This is the bunion that we're really talking about, okay? Anything that you do on these other guys, yes, you can do 100%, but it is 100% palliative is what you're doing. You're not going to reverse any of these bunions. Could you get this toe to be a little bit straighter, but will it stay? Probably not. This guy right here is your, your magic one that you want to show as your example. Okay. So here, this is rock tape. So you can use rock tape um, or KT tape. Um, I'm not a huge fan of using kinesiology tape on bunions just because the stretch is very high in this tape, but you can. And does it stimulate the proprioceptive system to create a little bit more stability in the foot? Sure, you could look at it from that perspective. Correct toes or any other toe spacer? Absolutely. In any of my patients that have bunions and do not want surgery, Right? Remember, that could be any of these feet. If they say, I understand that you cannot reverse my bunion, but I do not and will not have bunion surgery, not a problem. I will tell you how to make your foot more functional and make you more comfortable and try to stabilize your foot to core sequencing, knowing that anything that I do, once you take off that device, your bunion is going to go back or your toe is going to deviate right back. Okay, but absolutely you could use correct toes or a toe spacer. If you have a more severe bunion, I would say to use the correct toes and the toe spacers all the time in your shoes, when you're doing yoga and when you're working out, you really do want to use that as a buttress. So it's kind of mimicking a mechanical buttress so that your toe cannot deviate over. It'll help create more stability. Will it shift your sesamoids over? Probably not. Um, typically when you shift sesamoids over in bunion surgery, it is very aggressive, very aggressive to pull these sesamoids over. And remember the sesamoid is the indicator of intrinsic muscle alignment. Intrinsic muscle alignment is technically an indicator of your foot to core sequencing potential because of how the abductor hallucis short foot muscle corrects to your, or connects to your pelvic floor. Uh, and then here real quick, this is a bunion booty. So those are three ways that you could do it. Short foot, this is a modified short foot exercise or a posterior tibialis muscle exercise, strengthens the post tib, strengthens the intrinsics, right? Short foot is a go-to to build a strong foot. It is to try to reverse uh, any rear foot pronation. I would couple this with your glute strengthening, with single leg training, with core training. Yes, yes, yes to everything that I promote through EBFA. In the mild bunion, this is where we're getting a, uh, not a reversal, but a better alignment of the digit. In the other ones, you're trying to achieve more of a baseline function without a cosmetic reversal of the bunion. I just want to clarify that. 
Okay. Now this is one exercise myth that I do want to make sure is debunked as it relates to bunions is that there is a exercise where you can put a, um, like a band around your hallexes and then you lift just your hallux. And this is told to correct bunions, <coughs> which makes absolutely no sense. I don't even know who started that. Um, ironically, I see a lot of those posts around the yoga community. It does nothing for reversing bunions. When you lift your hallux off of the floor, and if you wanna do this with me now, when you lift your hallux off of the floor, your arch goes higher, sure. I'll give you that, right? But the reason that your arch went higher is because you just activated the windless mechanism. The windless mechanism is between your plantar fascia and your first MPJ. So every time you dorsiflex your first MPJ or you extend your toes up, you tighten your plantar fascia and your plantar fascia, which originates on your heel, is it's inverted, okay? That's what the windless mechanism is. This is mimicked by if you were to do a calf raise. So when you do a calf raise, you are entering what's called a rigid lever position, and that's how you stabilize your foot. So if you are essentially do a calf raise and become a rigid lever, and then you just put your foot on the floor, you essentially just mimicked this position that the foot is in, right? My toe is off of the floor and you see my arch. Just because I lift my toe and activate the windless mechanism does not mean that my arch is becoming stronger. It just doesn't make sense. That, that's not how you strengthen the arch by lifting your helix. Your plantar fascia does not control your arch height. So, and you really can't strengthen your plantar fascia in that way. Um, also, if you were to strengthen your extensor hallucis longus, that actually has absolutely no mechanism around a bunion. The muscles that you strengthen around a bunion are your posterior tibialis and the intrinsic muscles that we went over. Um, you also don't want to strengthen your extensor digitorum brevis because that muscle sits right here where this person's thumb is and it pulls the toe this way. Oops. It pulls the toe out towards the fifth. So it actually accentuates a bunion. Huh. So do not think of this as a go-to bunion corrective exercise to strengthen and lift the toe up. We really want to make sure that we are understanding the anatomy and why we're doing certain exercises. And just because you read it on a blog or on an article or someone that you follow on social media posted as a bunion exercise does not mean that it is a bunion exercise. Okay, off that soapbox, so sorry. All right, so now, next misconception is that bunion surgery does not work. Do not get bunion surgery. Uh, bunion surgery, if you get bunions, then a bunion surgery, my friend had it and her bunion came back, so don't do it because I guarantee you your bunion will come back. Not true. Okay. Now, what I will say is that if you have bunion surgery and you do the wrong procedure, then your bunions can come back. Now, this is where what we went over way in the beginning of saying, what is a bunion? Where is the actual uh, center of deformity in a bunion? And then that helps you to understand the surgery and what procedures should be done for a surgery. We had said that bunions are an instability at the first ray. The center of deformity for a bunion is the met cuneiform joint, which means that a lot of the bunion surgery to be successful needs to be done at the met cuneiform joint. A lot of bunion surgery is done cosmetically at the head, which means that they never fix the problem. They essentially put a Band-Aid on it and your foot looks great, 
but they didn't stabilize the joint where the bunion actually formed. So eventually your bunion does come back. And I can always tell which bunions are going to come back based off of the x-rays at the time of surgery. And sure enough, within 10 years, that's kind of the average year that the bunion will come back, 10 to 15 years, boop, patient bunion comes back and they're, they're seeking to have another surgery. So let's take a look at some of these surgeries. This is an example of not good surgery, <laughs> okay? So if we look here, this is, this is a great example of what I wanted to show you about the Met's cuneiform joint. And I said there's an obliquity, so I'm just kind of uh, hashing it around. The obliquity at the Met's cuneiform joint is a radiographic indicator of the severity of the bunion. Okay, so when you have a larger obliquity, you know that you have increased instability at the met cuneiform joint. That person, hands down, I would only do a surgery that fuses the met cuneiform joint. This person sadly went to a surgeon that did not do that, and they tried to address it at the head. So this is putting a band aid on the problem. This patient very sadly is going to look at their foot cosmetically after this surgery and think it looks great, right? Oh, looks great. My bunion is gone until 10 years later, their bunion comes back. And then why I feel so bad for this patient is that when their bunion does come back, the next surgeon has to address the fact that one, you have these very long screws. This is ridiculous to have this much hardware in here. I would not want this in my foot, but you would have this much hardware and then your bone is now misshaped. It's almost C-shaped. This is very, very difficult surgeries to correct once you have this done. But this is an example of where it would be. This is how we want to have it done. This is a beautiful surgery. So look at this is the pre before, right? So here's the medial eminence, the bump, the sesamoids are shifted over, right? Lateral shifted the sesamoids, slight obliquity at the met cuneiform joint. They addressed it by fusing the met cuneiform joint. This is called a lapidus procedure. And then look at the beautiful alignment of the sesamoids after the surgery, right? We have great alignment of that joint right? Some good joint space in there still. This I would put as a high, high success, okay? So depending on the surgeon that you go, go to, depending on the procedure that is done, you can have a very high success rate with bunion surgery. But where the misconceptions come out on the internet is when you get, unfortunately, patients who are going through this and then have a bad experience and then their bunions come back. So that would be a misconception because of uh, surgeon inconsistency, let's say. Now, let's go over when I recommend someone to have surgery because that's something that you guys might have questions around is, if you have a client, athlete, patient who has a bunion and the bunion is painful, usually that's the first indicator is that you have surgery once it's painful. If you have a large bunion, it's not painful. Some surgeons won't even operate on you. Other thing that I look at is what is the joint health? So if you're looking at the first MP joint, MPJ under x-ray and you see a lot of joint space narrowing and you're starting to see spurring and wearing down of the cartilage and they are 35 years old, 40 years old. I know that they're not going to get another 40 plus years out of that joint. So then I say, this may be the time to do a surgery such as this and get beautiful results. You're going to do a lapidus and then you'll be able to preserve that joint. When you're in the middle of the surgery, you could even do a stem cell graft on top of there to get some new cartilage cell regeneration here. Beautiful, beautiful. That's what we want to do. Now, if you wait too long, 
you wait past that sweet spot and now you have bone on bone, you cannot do the same bunion procedures. You will actually have to fuse that joint or do a joint implant because there's not enough cartilage left after the surgery. And if you align a joint and create joint space and you have no cartilage, then you're going to be moving on no cartilage and you could actually induce even more pain in that client or in that patient. Okay, so that's kind of that sweet spot of where you want to find it is what's the joint health? Do they have pain? What's their age? What's their activity level? And are we at this sweet spot that we want to try to preserve the joint so that they can get some good mileage out of the rest of the joint? If they're at a certain point, let's go back here real quick. And we are sitting kind of around really even this, this moderate one. Let's say you're 40 years old and you're here and you have uh, you know, grade two arthritis and you have pain in the joint and you're this moderate level. I would probably tell you to do surgery. If it was my foot, I would have surgery now versus me thinking that I can have a bunion that size and use correct toes and do short foot and strengthen my foot and get another 40 years out of my life and still run marathons every year because that's my hobby or my pastime. It's just, you're not gonna get enough distance out of that joint. It's not physiologically possible. Um, and that doesn't mean anything bad if they do have bunion surgery. It doesn't mean that you're anti-barefoot or anti-natural foot function because you have bunion surgery, right? So we want to kind of not, not make having bunion surgery be associated with this anti-barefoot concept, okay? Um, so just if you can change that mindset around that as well, because I am a proponent on bunion surgery at the right time and the right procedure. So let's go into what a bunion is not. And then I'm going to take any questions that you have and any misconceptions that you might have or have heard or things that you want to kind of clarify, but we'll go into it so that we get all of your questions answered. So what a bunion is not Hallux rigidus. This is not a bunion. Um, some people will refer to this as a dorsal bunion uh, is maybe a term that you have heard. And this is because the spurs are sitting on top versus on the side, but that's just kind of more like a layman's terms. It's really hallux rigidus. And that is arthritis of the first MPJ without the presence of an actual bunion. You can have a joint that looks exactly like that, but have a large bunion, and then that would still be a hallux valgus, eventually leading to a hallux rigidus. But to have an arthritis, arthritic joint does not mean you have to have a bunion, okay? So we just want to remember that. Uh, hallux varus, so this is a slight bunion on the left foot, and then this person, oh, poor person, this was a complication of their bunion surgery that, uh, remember I told you that you uh, have the release of the adductor hallucis as part of bunion surgery. So having that release, so they most likely cut the adductor hallucis and they most likely cut some of the uh, lateral capsule and then in the surgery, what often happens is that when you uh, are closing everything up, you have to close the capsule. And sometimes people will tighten the medial side of the capsule very aggressively, or they could have accidentally released the flexor hallucis brevis lateral belly. And essentially you've over dominated the abductor muscles and then you created a hallux varus. So this is a complication and this is not easy to correct um, as far as in another surgery because some of the tissue was cut, like I had mentioned, some of the intrinsic muscles. Um, but this would be a bunion complication due to a over aggressive correction, hallux varus. Okay, and then, then this is the last example of what a bunion is not, even though there is a bunion here, but this person has, do you see how all the metatarsals are angled like this? This person actually has metatarsal adductus. So metaductus, if you've ever heard of that, that's when someone has a C-shaped foot, 
kind of this curved shaped foot, metaductus. We go into this in the BTS level one. When you have a metaductus, this is what it looks like on x-ray. But when you have a bunion and metaductus, a bunion always looks so much worse on a metaductus foot. Just something to think about, okay? And then here you can see the correction that they had to swing the first metatarsal over. They essentially did a lapidus, right? Which is the fusion. And then they did a correction at the second and at the third. And here they're using staples to, to hold the metatarsals in place or the fusions in place. Okay, but metaductus is different than just a straight bunion. And like I said, it can accentuate a bunion. All right, so what are some of your possible misconceptions around bunions or questions that you might have around bunions? Because I know that there's gonna be a lot, this is a hot, hot, hot topic. And I'm gonna start going through some of those so that we can make sure that everyone is on the same page. All right, so uh, Emily Park has a question around exercise miss. If you put a smaller rubber brand around both helix and you do short foot, would that help alignment of the first MPJ? Uh, absolutely 100%. So that's what I would suggest. So if you have a bunion, you can put a, um, it used to be called a broccoli band or kind of those wristbands around both helixes at the same time and do short foot. 100%, right? You want to make sure that you're bringing alignment into the first MPJ when you do short foot, okay? You want to make sure that you bring alignment into the helix when you do short foot on someone who has a bunion. Are you doing that with a band? Are you doing that with rock tape? Are you doing that with a bunion booty? Are you doing that with correctos? Are you doing that with a resistance band? You choose, but you want to pull alignment into that first MPJ on someone with a bunion when they do uh, short foot. Um, and then she says, are you saying that that does nothing to change the bunions because it focuses only on the first MPJ? Um, so yes, so you are bringing the correction to the bunion when you do short foot to try to create stability between the intrinsics and the deep core. As soon as you take that splint off of the toe, that toe is gonna to deviate back over. That's what I mean, okay? I like to do correct toes and bands and splints when you are exercising. And because the toe deviates over, this is why I like correct toes and I like correct toes to be worn in the shoes at all times because the toe is going to deviate back over. Um, there is something that you can tell, um, it's called tracking. And what it is, is that when someone is sitting with their foot straight out, open chain, and you move the hallux, you move the hallux, you can actually feel that when you go to move it, it gets pulled over into the adducted position. It gets pulled over adducted. And that's, it's called tracking. And it's essentially showing you how tight and strong the adductor hallucis is. If you feel that when you move someone's first MPJ, as soon as you take that, that band or the correct toes or the bunion booty off, that toe is going over. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. And I hope that that's coming across. Um, Regarding the metcuniform fusion, the lapidus procedure, um, it corrects the bunion, but what is the impact on the restriction of motion at the joint? Um, that's a really good question. And there's actually not that much of a impact at that joint um, because it's fused in a proper position, meaning it's not fused elevated, it's not fused plantar flex, and it's in, a, in an alignment position you have a little bit of motion of the first ray relative to the helix, but it's, uh, when you think of risk benefit, the stability of the met cuneiform joint to prevent the bunion is far greater benefit than any degree of motion that you need for your first MPJ. I hope that makes sense. Um, will the Naboso insoles help? Um, 
the naboso insoles will help in the sense that when you stimulate the nerves, you strengthen the intrinsic muscles. Intrinsic muscle strengthening to stop a bunion or slow the progression of the bunion is most effective in the more mild bunions. The more severe it becomes, then uh, everything is palliative. I hope that that helps. Um, how does a bunion affect the pelvic floor? So when someone has a bunion, you can just assume that their foot is delayed. So anytime someone has a bunion, just assume that their foot is delayed, delayed stability, right? It's slower, it's a slower foot. So when someone's foot is slower, the timing of the, the deep core and hip stabilizers is going to be a little bit slower because of that. That means turn to correct toes in your shoes, use some sort of um, splint, foot strengthening, the naboso insoles. You need things to help build strength in the foot, knowing that the bunion is going to keep trying to unravel the stability and the strength of the pelvic floor and the pelvis and the deep hip. Again, I hope that this is making sense for everyone. And I, I really don't want it to sound like I'm on this soapbox about things related to bunions. Um, it's just the one area of foot pathology that uh, Corrective exercise is not the be all end all. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of other things that it is, but there is a time and place for bunion surgery. There's a high success around surgery. And we wanna make sure that we're just addressing this appropriately and not giving false hope or misconceptions to our clients around the efficacy of corrective exercise, okay? Um, is Correct Toes the product name? Yes, it is. So if you go to correcttoes.com, Correct Toes is that toe spacer. That is one type. Now, what I will say around the toe spacers is that um, right here, these ones that are pictured are Correct Toes. Now, for some women who have shorter toes or men who have shorter toes, um, they actually have a hard time keeping correct toes on. If you have a really small foot, again, it's a little bit more tendency towards women, then they feel that they are too big or too stiff. So you can get some silicone toe spacers off of Amazon. Um, even like for five bucks, you can get toe spacers off Amazon. And sometimes they're a little bit lower profile that work better on those that have small toes, short toes, smaller feet. So just know that as well. Okay, but correcttoes.com is this specific brand. Um, any concrete measurements for different types of bunions? Um, yes, so Sean asked this. This is based off of the intermetatarsal angle. I don't know if you have access to x-rays and we'll be measuring intermetatarsal angles, um, but really you would be looking at eight to 10, eight to 10 degrees of that inter intermetatarsal angle is normal. 10 to 12 degrees is mild. 12 to 14 is moderate. 14 to 16 plus is going to be severe. Um, if you're not looking at x-rays and intermetatarsal angles, then really you, then you're almost looking at it subjectively, which is not what I recommend. Um, but I would go back to the picture that I had sent and anything that is a mild prominence. So you can't really measure the prominence. I encourage you not to try to create your own mechanism of severity and measure the, the prominence of the eminence, the size of the eminence, because that's you making up your own system and that's not really evidence-based. Um, it's truly based off of the angle. Um, I would say that maybe classify them in two ways, that one is a little bit more on this corrective exercise appropriate, and then one is more potentially a surgical candidate. That's really how I tell my patients, that I say you have mild, moderate, severe, and when you're on, here's moderate, 
the moderate to mild side of the scale, this is where I'm talking to you about corrective exercise. As soon as you get on this side of moderate, I'm having the surgical conversation with you. And if you don't wanna have surgery, that's fine. I still had the conversation with you. And if you refuse surgery, then we do what's over here. But just know the efficacy of what's over here is going to be lower because you're on this side of moderate. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, Jerry has a question. If one has flat feet, is it okay to strengthen and train barefoot and with minimal shoes? A hundred percent you can. Um, and again, that has to do with the severity of the flat feet. Um, if you have mild pronation, similar to mild bunions, Absolutely, 100%. That's where you could correct your overpronation with corrective exercise and intrinsic strengthening and glute strengthening and core strengthening. If you have severe overpronated flat feet, then I would be careful with the intensity of what you're doing in minimal shoes and bare feet. But I believe that everybody needs barefoot stimulation and everybody can tolerate minimal shoes depending on the intensity of what they're doing. That sounded like a total politician answer, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, Melissa asked for someone who has juvenile helix valgus due to ligament laxity, does short foot help slow the progression? Great question. So for someone who has a juvenile helix valgus, so remember this is where I said that this was in um, teenagers right? Or you have someone really early 20s with a bunion and they said they had bunions forever. This type of foot, really ligament laxity, true ligament laxity is a midfoot problem. Midfoot pronation and midfoot ligament laxity really needs orthotics. Should you be uh, only using orthotics? No. So I would say orthotics plus correct, corrective exercise and foot strengthening. But in someone who has a true ligament laxity and midfoot pronation and hypermobile foot, and they're not in orthotics and they're only doing corrective exercise, the success of what you're doing is going to be much lower. And the reason is that ligament laxity means that you've lost a huge mechanical stability of the foot and you have very high force and load going through the foot. And again, you're just defined physics by trying to build muscular strength to overcome actual ligament integrity. You can't do that. You need ligaments first and then the muscles stabilize on top of those ligaments. So I would suggest having some sort of um, orthotic, it could be even over the counter, or consultation around the appropriateness of orthotics. And then you do the corrective exercise in synergy with the orthotics. Um, and this is in a true ligament lax foot that is hypermobile and has juvenile helix valgus. Great question though. Um, is it possible that a bunion at the metcuniform alignment can develop from the top down, meaning pelvic floor, uh, chronically tight hip flexors, et cetera. Um, typically, typically, uh, let me show you the x-rays. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get to an x-ray that has that here. Typically a, uh, First rate instability this size or even this size, anything that a lapidus is truly appropriate, that's usually not a top down issue. That is usually an inherent ligament laxity in the foot or they have midfoot pronation. Um, it's so it, I've never seen a, a top down uh, weak glutes causing a severe first rate instability leading to a lapidus procedure. It's usually foot specific, usually foot specific. Um, great. Okay. Um, do you recommend the correct devices? Sorry. 
My eyes are killing me. Do you recommend the corrective device that has a brace on it on the medial side of the foot? Do you recommend? I think Denise is asking, do you recommend more like a, a bunion splint, which people wear at night? Um, now those are very different. So if you Google bunion splint, that is very different than correct toes. That's very different than bunion booties. Bunion booty and correct toes are things that you can wear in your shoes. Rock tape, K tape, you can wear in your shoes. A bunion splint is something that has to be worn without shoes when you're sitting. You cannot walk in them. A lot of people wear, will wear them at the end of the day. Some people might wear them at night when they're sleeping. They're meant to be more like a, you know, doing bedtime splint stretch mechanism. Um, I'm not a big fan of those because where the impact of bunions is much more Every time you take a step, it destabilizes the foot and it makes it difficult taking proper stride length and stabilizing the deep core. So I look at bunions from a functional perspective versus a cosmetic. I'm using a splint to stretch the toe over so it has better alignment cosmetically. I'm thinking much more. I just want that toe alignment when you're actually ambulating so that we can stabilize your core. So I would favor more correct toes and bunion splint, uh, bunion booty and taping. Um, I have juvenile bunions. This indicates laxity. Yes. Um, so for Nicole, who said she has juvenile bunions, so I'm guessing she had bunions since she was a teenager. Um, this indicates ligament laxity. Yes. Is surgery the only option? Yes, to correct it. But if you don't want to have surgery and you want to try to slow down the progression of the bunion, you want to try to build foot stability through orthotics, corrective exercise, and any of the correct toes and the bunion booties. That is creating balance. That's not going to reverse it. It might slow it down. If you want your foot to look like a foot without a bunion, like this x-ray here, the only way is with surgery. I hope that helps. Uh, Ruth has a question. Is it common for someone with bunions to also have their first MPJ lift? Um, I meaning the toe is a little bit off of the floor that they've lost purchase of the helix. Yes, uh, when it rotates, sometimes you can lose the articulation of the, the joint and the way that it purchases the floor. Yeah, I would say that would be more of a later stage bunion or a more severe bunion. But yes, you could see that. Um, Martha has a question. My feet have grown since wearing the zero shoes for five years. I was already two sizes up after. Oh, so you, I, that is a lot. <laughs> okay. So um, Martha had said that her feet have grown since wearing uh, zero shoes for five years. And that makes sense. So your feet are going to become wider. So the more that you wear minimal shoes, your feet will become wider. Uh, some people will say that that's a negative. Us who love barefoot minimal shoes know that that's actually healthy for your feet. But if you then try to get into, let's say, um, like high heels or something like that, and you're a female who always wears barefoot shoes, you will then think that it's much more painful to get into high heel shoes because your feet have actually become wider or your toe space uh, and intermetatarsal spaces have actually opened up. So I totally get it. Um, another question uh, is, is it possible, helpful in any way to taper splint the space between the first and second? Uh, for To prevent the oblique deviation to support the intrinsic activation. Uh, so yes, so you that's, 
Emily, essentially that's what I was saying, that correct toes, rock tape, bunion booty is essentially what you are asking here. And yes, so you are taping between the first and the second. Um, so yes, uh, does a more in short toe does a more and short toe increase likelihood of bunions? Um, that's not such a thing. Morton's toe is actually a long second toe, not a short toe. Um, and that does not increase the risk of a bunion. So they would be incidentally related. Um, does having a dropped first ray go hand in hand with having a bunion? Uh, so part of having a bunion is you get your first metatarsal can rotate like this. So you're actually not dropping, but it's the rotation. So you might feel like you have increased pressure on part of the first met head and then one of the sesamoids because the first metatarsal rotated, um, which is what I believe you are thinking, Tara, with the first ray plantar flexing. Um, how do you address the drop? Um, you really can't without surgery. The distal MPJ sitting low to the phalanx hyperextending and dorsiflexing. Uh, so you really can. So she's asking if your first metatarsal drops and rotates because of the bunion, which is, like I said, part of the bunion, how do you address that with corrective exercise? You can't. You cannot. And that's one of the things that um, surgery is important to consider in certain presentations of bunions because not all aspects of the structural changes of the first metatarsal and the first MPJ can be addressed with corrective exercise. This is a great example of one. Uh, so Nicole asked, what is the best way to build foot stability, barefoot training, intrinsic foot strengthening, foot to core, short foot, glute strengthening, balance training, Naboso. Um, Nicole, I would check out any of um, EBFA's content around bear. Our barefoot training specialist goes into some great foot to core strengthening. I would check that out. Um, I'm going to do two more questions and then we are wrapping up. So many questions on bunions, my goodness. So two more questions. Um, would athletic or biomechanical taping for hyperpronation add any benefit to the folks who do exercises you mentioned in person, not wanting to do surgery? Uh, so Chris, yes, if you do taping, so let's say someone overpronates um, and they don't want to do surgery, could you do orthotics? Could you do taping? I would say to do uh, really orthotics over taping. The reason why if you do taping, as soon as you do that taping, they go right back to where they were, similar to the bunions. Um, in the moment when they're taped, are they creating more optimal activation patterns? Yes. But at what cost? Because again, as soon as you take that tape off, it's going to go right back to where it was. Um, so that's where I would honestly look at orthotics, especially if they have ligament laxity. Taping a ligament lax foot is like putting a Band-Aid on it. I really um, would rather look more at orthotics because you don't want to keep taping. Um, and this is kind of the reality of trying to use taping to create more optimal foot or bunion positions is if someone is doing a taping technique to create stability in the foot or the toe, do you want them to tape for the rest of their life? A lot of people start to have skin issues with taping day and day and day and day. Um, so that's where you could say, hey, if this taping helps you, now imagine what an orthotic could do because the orthotic is essentially doing the same as the taping but through a different mechanism. And it doesn't involve actually adhering something to the foot every single day. That's how I look at it. And if they do get benefit from the tape, boom, I shift them into an orthotic. But yes, you could from a short-term perspective. Um, Ooh. 
Now, Emily has a question of, could you do SMR with rad rollers at the adductor hallucis do enough to minimize the metacuniform deviation? Unfortunately, no. If it was, we would not have to do a release of the um, adductor hallucis during surgery. Remember, we cut that muscle when we do bunion surgery. So SMR, stretching, massage, it is not enough when your bunion is severe. Uh, okay, last one, last one. If you hold have bunion surgery, what happens to the kinetic chain in a nutshell? Oh wait, if you hold off on bunion surgery. Uh, so if you do not want to do bunion surgery and you have a severe bunion and you do not use correct toes, you will start to lose stability at your core, at your hip, your glutes will be underactive. If you have a severe bunion and you use orthotics and correct toes, could you get a little bit more stability in the core and in the glutes? Yes. Um, will you replace the, the benefit of doing surgery? No, but does it buy you time? Sure. You have to use something in your shoes when you're moving though. Correct toes, orthotics, something like that. Otherwise, if you walk around in minimal shoes with a severe bunion and you don't do anything to create better alignment, you're not going to have strong glutes, strong core, strong foot to core because of that bunion. That bunion is the little monkey wrench that we need to address. Um, so as I summarize, I want to kind of go into some of the key takeaways because I, I really don't want anyone being confused and I feel like uh, I'm confusing myself, <laughs> is that bunions, for the most part, you're trying to create balance in them as much as possible. You cannot reverse bunions without surgery. You cannot reverse bunions without surgery. A bunion is the first uh, met cuneiform intermetatarsal angle. It is not what your hallux looks like relative to your foot. It is also your sesamoid position. So if you have a hallux that is in good alignment with the foot, but your sesamoids are still, st still sitting laterally, your intrinsics are not in good alignment. Your intrinsics have to be in good alignment to have proper foot to core sequencing. Surgery is the only way to get those sesamoids over. You cannot get them over by stretching and bunion splints and releasing the adductors and things like that. It just, it doesn't work. These are very strong deforming forces. So really, I think what would be the even bigger message that we're trying to take away here is prevent bunions in the first place. So catch your clients, catch the feet that are first, first, first showing the earliest signs of bunions, or they might have a foot type that is predisposed for bunions, an overpronated foot. And you say, I want you to listen to me and we're gonna do short foot and foot to core and glute strengthening and barefoot and naboso because I do not want you to ever get a bunion because once you get a bunion, you cannot reverse it and it leads to all these issues and at some point you might need surgery. So let's just stay on the side of prevention. That is so much easier. But I hope that this puts a little bit of perspective on how to address bunions or the reality of bunions and that what our role as movement specialists for severe bunions is to do things modifications in the shoes so that when they're walking around, they're creating as much stability as possible. If you do tape on a severe bunion, as soon as you take that tape off, it's going back. If you tape an overpronated foot that's severe, and as soon as you take that tape off, it's going back. These are very strong deforming forces that we want to understand and appreciate. This is where orthotics might come into play. This is where surgery might come into play. And if you still have questions after this, which I do apologize if you do, then please reach out to me and I can do any consultation with you, with the client or with the patient to understand the appropriateness of surgery or not surgery for them or corrective exercise or not, just shoot me an email. If you wanna kind of dive into this a little bit more, we have um, several advanced foot and ankle courses on the EBFA YouTube channel or on the EBFA Teachable platform. And they're all 30% off now through uh, December 31st, just use code EOY30 and that will get you 30% off any of our courses. 
through the Teachable platform through the end of the year. I thank you guys so much for your time. I hope that you have a happy holidays and I will see you on the next EBFA webinar. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for all of your amazing questions to everyone. And if you still have questions, just email me and I will uh, make sure that I get to those. And there are many more questions that are on another panel that I did not know existed. <laughs> so um, I will uh, make sure that I get to these. And if not, just email me education at ebfafitness.com, education at ebfafitness.com. I'm gonna end the recording, but if you want to stay tuning in on these, then,